This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Now, my dad had a 1968 Oldsmobile with a convertible top. And I remembered that the Oldsmobile was parked beside my grandmother's house, right there a mile from where we were. So we went there at 2 o'clock in the morning to open the boot, to get a jacket, and hopefully get another tire. And when I opened that boot, the first thing I seen was cement blocks and coat hangers. And it hit me. Now, the news just had come out about him floating two days before. And this joker with me was 14, 15 years old, this Vanderford guy. I immediately slammed the boot shut. I said, no, nah, he don't have a jack. And the guy says, what's all them blocks doing in there? I try to minimize that. I don't remember what I said, but it scared me to death. We didn't finish the car that night. And we walked back to my cousin's house, which is three miles away. And all I could think of was getting my dead, getting my dead. Because in my mind, I knew it. I knew at age 11 that those were cement blocks and the coat hangers that were used to sink that man. All that was on my mind was to warn him so he could rectify his mistake of, and my mistake of taking somebody to the car and allow them to see what was in it. I felt like I had screwed up. I said, Daddy, I need to talk to you. He said, well, talk, son. I said, Daddy, I need to talk to you by yourself. He had the strangest look on his face. He said, all right, honey, let, let me talk to him. So she walked out of the bathroom. I never will forget the look on his face. He was shaving. I said, Daddy, I messed up. We had a flat tire, and I went to that old boot with pop side grannies. And when I opened the boot, there were cement blocks and coals hangers in there. And this 14-year-old boy that I had with me seen them. And I closed the boot fast as I could, but he seen them. And I seen the alarm in his face. He said, well, why are you telling me that? I said, because, Daddy, that man just has floated in that river. And he tried his best to take that knowledge from me. He said, oh, son, no, you, you think it wrong. Uh, them blocks, them coal, we had so-and-so. He gave me some lame story about what they had to do so-and-so. But he got dressed pretty fast. Billy Sunday Bird was a whiskey man. He was a bank robber. He was a hit man. He was a murderer. He was the enforcer for the Dixie Mafia. He's also my father. For almost a decade, the Dixie Mafia were an unstoppable ragtag crime syndicate in the southeastern United States. And what began as a small, backwoods bootlegging operation quickly escalated to bank robbery, jewelry heists, drugs, betrayal, and murder. Before it's all said and done, more than 50 people will be dead at the hands of one man alone. The most notorious man you've never heard of. Dixie Mafia hitman, Billy Sunday Burt. From Imperative Entertainment, this is In the Red Clay. Despite being a well-known and much-feared member of his small community, Bert managed to evade capture. Because everyone knew, if you were a witness to any one of Bert's crimes, you simply disappeared. I'm going to go out on a limb here, and bet you've probably never even heard the name Dixie Mafia before. 
It's not exactly a household name like the Italian mafia is made famous in American pop culture by movies like Goodfellas, The Godfather, and more recently, The Irishman. But if by chance you have heard the name, what you've heard is wrong. Most of what's out there is based on pure speculation, word of mouth, or bits of misinformation that have been pieced together over the years and passed around the internet. The Deep South has always been home to a special brand of outlaw. In the 1960s, a homegrown crime cartel rose to power and ruled this swampy underworld for decades. The Dixie Mafia. This group of organized... That clip you just heard is from a Discovery Channel series from a few years back. And there was a movie made in 1973 about a McNary, Tennessee professional wrestler turned sheriff named Buford Pusser who waged a one-man war on moonshine, prostitution, and gambling until his murder in 1974. I thought you walked tall! You gotta learn how to crawl! Walking Tall. The story of a real man who has become a living legend. The media called the group responsible for his death, you guessed it, the Dixie Mafia. A term coined by ATF Special Agent Jim West while giving an interview to a local newspaper in 1970. The name stuck, and quickly spread throughout the South. And let's be honest, for some, the word Dixie might conjure up images of some rebel flag-waving, white-sheet-wearing hillbilly. But that's not the case here. These were country boys, but they were smart. Smart enough, and dangerous enough, to get the attention of JFK's brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, who sent ATF special agents to Northeast Georgia, and Jimmy Carter, who would implement his anti-bootlegging campaign dubbed Operation Dry Up. All told, in Northeast Georgia alone, there would be nearly 200 agents from the CIA, FBI, ATF, GBI, local and state law enforcement involved in trying to bring the group down. But what's the real story then? Who were these guys, and where did they come from? Well, that begins in Georgia in 1965, during our country's last real boom in illegal liquor production, or moonshining. But to fully understand how this all went down, you have to know what America was like in the mid-60s. And this is where our story begins. The year of 1965, 365 days, each with headaches and heartaches, death and destruction, laughter and tears. And the tears flowed all over the world in January. 1965 was one of the most pivotal years in modern American history. Astronaut Ed White makes the first U.S. spacewalk in Gemini 4. It looks beautiful. I feel like a million dollars. Come back to you. After 3 o'clock along the eastern seaboard, Pilot White had opened up a new frontier for Americans to explore. The Beatles performed the first ever stadium concert in the history of rock music at Shea Stadium in New York City. Here are the Beatles! And Sandy Koufax pitches a perfect game against the Chicago Cubs. But 1965 was a turbulent year, too. On March 8th, 3,500 U.S. Marines stepped foot on the shores of Da Nang. They were the first wave of U.S. combat troops to enter the Vietnam War. And at home, America was at war with itself, as much as it was with Vietnam. Violent anti-war protests draw 100,000 people in 80 cities across the country. State troopers clashed with civil rights demonstrators in Selma, Alabama, in what became known as Bloody Sunday. And the United States federal government, once again, waged war on illegal alcohol. This was a big deal, especially in the South, because not since the Prohibition era of the 1920s had the federal government gone to such lengths to stop the production and sale of illegal alcohols like whiskey, brandy, and beer. Local and state police, along with FBI and ATF agents, 
were tasked with locating and destroying liquor stills throughout the southern states, namely Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, and the Carolinas. The law would ride the road and walk the creeks looking for liquor stills. You used to say every other house sold liquor. So if you stopped this house, you couldn't find nothing. You go to the next house and you'd find something. Agents worked tirelessly to bust illegal beer joints and whiskey haulers and would stake out suspected liquor still locations, often silently watching through the night, whether it be in the nauseating humidity of the summer or the dead of winter. An agent's post might require him to spend all night laying on the forest floor as still and quiet as possible, waiting for a bootlegger to show and tend to still. Clyde Vinson a pioneering African-American lawman in Shelby County, Tennessee, recalled once laying on a snake all night while watching a liquor still. He couldn't move for fear of being detected. But why go through such lengths to stop a few people from making booze out in the middle of the woods? Why does it really matter? The answer? Money. In 2018... Revenue from alcohol tax amounted to $10.6 billion. It's reported that bootleg liquor costs the U.S. government upwards of $200 million per year in untaxed sales. The irony in all of this, though, is in the 1960s, most of the people making the liquor had little to no money to start with. Bootlegging supplemented their farming income, and at times, it was the only source of income they had. 90 year old John Partee recalls what life was like back in them days. Back in them days, I had to make a living. So if you didn't make a good cotton crop, man, you had, to, you had to feed the family some way. And that's just what it was. A way to make a living. Any way that you could make enough money to feed your family, even if it meant breaking the law, was worth doing when times got tough enough. And everybody depend on, you know, the merchants, is that they depended heavy. They get to sell their fruit jars and sugar and their service station. They, they, they benefit from it. And just about everybody did, you know. The farmers did. They got to sell their corn and stuff to the moonshiners. That mentality especially rang true to those people who lived through the Great Depression. For many, Bootlegging, which got its name from the Civil War soldiers who snuck whiskey into camp in small flasks hidden in their boots, became a way of life. But it would often bring with it criminal enterprise. Case in point, Prohibition-era Chicago brought mobsters like Al Capone and Babyface Nelson, among others. Because where there is illegal, untaxed money being made, especially from liquor, there are bound to be gangsters, sooner or later. But this time, it wasn't Chicago, and it wasn't Al Capone. It was just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, in the sleepy little farm town of Winder. If you made Andy Griffith's show a little more realistic, it was close. Everybody knew everybody. You walk in any any town store, no matter who you're seeing, you know them the mother, the grandmother. And they was just kind of a camaraderie between people. Everything was just goodwill. It was slower. You could have compared our lives to what it was like in Mayberry. It's the kind of small town that reminds you of an old black and white movie. A time before Facebook and Instagram, cell phones and GPS. The kind of place where even the police know people by their first name where they work, and their kids probably go to school together. At least, that's how it feels. And you'd be hard-pressed to find a building more than two or three stories high. It's a far cry from Los Angeles, where I'd lived for nearly two decades. It's small, quiet, friendly. When I arrived there in early March of 2019, I had no idea what secrets that little town held, or that that quiet little town would soon change the course of my life.
I was working as a location manager on the HBO series The Outsider with Jason Bateman. Part of my job was to go to Winder a week before the rest of our crew and get things ready for us to film there. I would be the liaison between the town and the production, so I needed to meet as many people as I could. One day, I stepped into the corner bookstore on Jackson Street near the main intersection of town. The place was filled with row after row of shelves, neatly packed with used books. Not borders, but I actually like the small town bookstore. A friendly, middle-aged man approaches me and asks if I need help. I explain why I'm there, and a woman, who I assume was his wife, who had emerged from the back room, offered me a place to sit and insisted on brewing a pot of coffee for me. There's that southern hospitality you've heard about. I sat at a table covered with stacks of folders and papers and miscellaneous office supplies which they hurriedly pushed to the side to clear a spot for me. We chat about all of the movies that have been filmed around the area over the years, how George is the new Hollywood. We talk about local places to see, local history, and eventually they ask, have you ever heard of the Dixie Mafia? I actually had. I lived in Memphis for a short time in my early 20s, and I remember hearing that name in passing, but I hadn't thought about it since. I mean, why would I? It seems like people still talk about it from time to time. I mean, is that true? I was on the plane with this guy telling him about the Dixie Mafia and Bill Sunday Burn. Well, he got infatuated with it. Dixie Mafia, the way I understand it, covered the South. It wouldn't. They can want to tell me the son of Billy Burt, the infamous leader of the Dixie Mafia, makes whiskey right here in town, just a few blocks away. Several people tell me I should talk with him. I'm told he's very nice and very interesting. As I left the bookstore, I'm asked if I want to buy a copy of the self-published book this man wrote about his father, but I pass. After all, that's not why I was there. And as it turns out, I would end up meeting this man they were talking about, but only by chance. Over the next few days, I made my way through the town and continued to meet residents and business owners and eventually found myself searching for a parking lot to store some film equipment. I came across an old building that was partially under construction. There's a small gravel lot next to it that has a huge mound of wooden railroad ties and miscellaneous piles of junk and wooden boards that look like they were part of some turn-of-the-century barn. The kind an HGTV host would die for. There's a large black sign above the door that reads, Rock Solid, in gold block letters. I walk over and knock on the door, and a large man answers. Now, I say large as in both physically and in personality. He's a little intimidating at first, standing at six foot or so with white slicked back hair and piercing blue eyes that squint narrowly in the sun. And a cigarette hangs from his lip. He wears a pair of faded, frayed blue jeans, and his white-collared dress shirt is so wet with sweat you can see through it, and he's covered in drywall dust and spatters of paint. And when he reaches out to shake my hand, holy shit, I've got big hands. But when I tell you that this man has big hands, think Andre the fucking giant big. The polite talkative 60-year-old speaks quickly and matter-of-factly in a thick southern accent. As we chat, I learn he's working night and day to build his dream, a distillery right here in the heart of Winder, a block away from the town's quaint little courthouse. He says it is to be his legacy. Apparently, the whiskey recipe he uses has been passed down in his family since before the Civil War. But something seems all too familiar about this. The distillery, making whiskey, a very interesting man. I asked if his name is Bert by chance, and sure enough, this was the man I'd heard about from the owner of the bookstore, Billy Stonewall Bert, Stoney for short. Almost immediately, and without hesitation, Stoney begins to tell me about his father. My father liked excitement, dance halls, gambling. He was just more adventurous. 
We talk for a while, and eventually I have to leave. But later on, I find I can't stop thinking about Stoney and the stories about his father. I find him oddly entertaining and captivating somehow, and I want to hear more. So I stop by periodically through the next few days. Each time he offers me a drink of whiskey or peach brandy that he's made. Well, not not for you, do if you don't. If you eat nothing that's cold whiskey, take a sip and tell me if you ever had butter. He casually spits out anecdotes about his father's exploits as if he's been practicing. He tells of how his father robbed banks in at least five states, how he once blew up a local liquor store with dynamite because the clerk was rude to his wife, or how he broke into the evidence room one night at the old sheriff's station across the street to retrieve a gun used in a murder. He pulls out a thick black leather binder and shows me the newspaper articles he's clipped and preserved in cellophane, making sure I know he isn't full of shit. He shows me the copper still that he makes his whiskey in, which is awesome, by the way. It's been in his family since his great-grandfather, Pink Hegwood, built it in 1860. And one of the most impressive things he shows me, being a car lover, is his Royal Blue 1970 Torino Cobra Superjet muscle car. And this car here was one of the cars that your dad was it it was he got the cyclone this is clocked at 185 loaded four men pretty woman sitting right here me 13 year old sitting between two in the back let's crank her up stoney loves talking about his father in fact he's proud of who his father was it seems And that was what our conversations inevitably circled back to, his father. He was the best family man you could ever want to meet. Anytime he seen a family without Christmas, a family who had just about to be evicted because of a light bill, he would take whatever it took and help them. It would just eat him to help people. But wait a minute. Are we talking about the same guy here? The same guy that blew up buildings with dynamite? and probably at one time or another had dead bodies in the trunk of his car, along with the illegal liquor he was hauling. And just like that, I was hooked. I had to know this man's story. I tell Stoney, this sounds like a movie, and he admits to me that he's been approached several times by people wanting to do just that, make a movie about his father and the Dixie Mafia. But there's a problem with that. Stoney comes from a different time and place than most of us. He's cut from a different cloth altogether. He can't tell you the difference between a touchdown and a home run, but he can tell you the odds of pulling an inside straight in a game of seven-card stud with three players. His father had a set of rules to live by that were instilled in him almost from birth, a sort of gangster's code. He had the ethics and code that made him unusual. He would not lie, and he hated a liar. Trust is a big thing to Stoney. Maybe the biggest thing. I could tell each time I stopped by that he was sizing me up, figuring me out, thinking, what's his motive? Each time, he would get slightly more comfortable with me. But the people that had come from Hollywood to try to get the rights to his father's life story... Well, to Stoney, they were mostly arrogant assholes. Those are his words. And they were just trying to get rich off this country bumpkin. Again, his words. For some reason, Stoney seemed to like me, though. I could tell that he wanted to tell his story. While he had self-published that book called Rock Solid, The True Story of George's Dixie Mafia, which you can buy on Amazon... He really only covered what you could find in the local newspapers, and it was more or less written to pass down to future generations of his family so that the story of his father wouldn't be lost after he was gone. But I knew there was a lot more to tell. He knew much more than he was letting on. So I approached Stoney with the idea of telling the stories of his father's life and the Dixie Mafia in a podcast. His response... What's a podcast? 
At first, he was skeptical, but eventually he agreed on one condition. I would tell this story exactly the way it happened. But who was this man that I've heard so much about from Stoney? Where did he come from? And how the hell did he become what law enforcement would call the deadliest man in Georgia history? And most people, including myself, have never even heard of him. of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and my daddy's mother said a lot of story by him. When my daddy was born, she named him Billy Sunday. Always was a God-fearing woman, and my daddy was raised right. He just got caught up and went the other way. There were so many similarities between them. They were both charismatic. They were both athletic. They were both extraordinary in their abilities. They were. And she, her wish was for him to become a man like Billy Sunday. But that's why he was named Better Sunday. It was my grandma's wish that he become a preacher. A good man like the best man she know, Better Sunday. America needs a tidal wave of the old time religion. America needs to be taken down to God's bathhouse and the hose turned on her. And the time isn't far distant when the wheels of God's judgment are going to go sweeping through this old God-hating world. And I want to take a pledge in this audience to join me in a pledge that you will never rest until this old God-hating, Christ-hating, whiskey-soaked, Sabbath-breaking, blaspheming, infidel, bootlegging old world is bound to the cross of Jesus Christ by the golden chains of love. Billy Sunday Burt was born in a small farmhouse in Hoshton, Georgia on August 12, 1937. His parents, Claude and Eunice Burt, were sharecroppers. Stoney explains. Everybody was poor. And here's the thing about the crop. That time of year when you took your crop in, the landlord who you share crop from would take it to market. He would sell it, he'd get the receipt. He would have the receipt to where he bought the seed and fertilizer from the hardware store. He would deduct the seed and fertilizer from the money of the sale of the crop. And then he split it 50-50 with the sharecroppers. The family moved around a lot. They had very little money, and Claude would often move the family into an abandoned shotgun shack where they would stay until the law happened along and kicked them out. He would load the family up into their wagon along with their meager possessions, and head out in search of another abandoned home to hole up in. The South was littered with these types of shotgun shacks at the time. The family moved 17 times in just one year. Claude and Eunice were good Christian people, though. Claude taught his children right from wrong and concentrated much of his teaching on his oldest son, Billy. He taught him to respect his elders, not to judge others, for you never know what they might have been through, and that a man either takes care of his family with the basics of food, shelter, love, and self-sacrifice, or he doesn't. Eunice used the Bible to teach her children morals and ethics, and would constantly tell Billy that you reap what you sow sevenfold before you leave this earth, for then you must pay for what you've done there. Claude and Eunice often struggled to make ends meet and provide for their eight children, Billy, his younger brothers Ray, Jimmy, and Bobby, and their four sisters. When you sold your crop, that was the only time in the whole year that a man could take his family to town and buy two or three outfits of clothes. Here's what it would be. It would be three pair of coverall, overalls, three cotton shirts, Three pair of socks, one pair of brogans. Brogans were a cheap leather work boot. But my dad's family, it was two pair. Now, them shoes had to last you to the next year. (laughs) And they never did. The Great Depression had just ended, 
but times were still extremely hard. The children were needed on the farm to work the cotton crop and often could only go to school a couple days a week if they were lucky. And Billy, who was born with a speech impediment, didn't care much for school anyway. The family struggled so much at one point, they didn't have enough to eat but one meal a day. This prompted six-year-old Billy Burt to take matters into his own hands and commit his very first crime. He stole a dollar out of the school teacher's purse to buy him and his sister something to eat. He wasn't caught, but it seemed not to be a smart thing to try again. He might not be so lucky next time. A year later, with times getting even harder, Billy would steal again, though, out of necessity. This time, it was a sandwich. And there was this one girl, he says, he remembers her like it was yesterday. And her family was uh, well-to-do. And she would bring the best-looking sandwiches that you have ever seen. This girl, she would only eat one sandwich and dangle the rest for the people to see. And at 3 o'clock when school let out, she'd go up there where the bus would pull up, and she'd sit in the lunchbox right there on the bench where the bus pulled up, and she'd take that sandwich out and put it on top. Well, that's about torture. <laughs> My daddy said he washed that sandwich for two weeks. And in his mind, he ate it many times. And this one day, he said he just couldn't take it. He said he caught nobody looking. He got that sandwich, took it behind school, and eat it. Best damn sandwich you ever eat. He said, remember it like today. He said it was an egg sandwich. It had mayonnaise on it, which was also unheard of, he said. Well, he got back around. Nobody seen it. Nobody seen it. Nobody noted. it. Little girl, bus pulled up. She come and missed that sandwich. And he, he said, you would have thought her mama and daddy had got killed in the car wreck. The fit she pitched. All hell broke loose. Billy would continue to steal food when he had nothing to eat and couldn't take the hunger pains anymore. But things would soon go from bad to worse for the Burt family. When he was just nine years old, Billy's father, Claude, died suddenly of either a heart attack or a stroke. No one's really sure. Eunice was left with trying to provide for her family alone, which seemed a near impossibility. Soon after Claude's death, the man that owned the farm they sharecropped on at the time, Mr. Morgan, delivered a crushing blow to the struggling family. He claimed that Claude had borrowed money from him shortly before he died, and since Eunice had no money to pay him back, he was taking the cotton crop they had harvested that year. That's their livelihood. That was everything to them. He even took the hogs and the piglets and left the grieving widow with eight children and no way to care for them. This act of cruelty left a huge impression on young Billy Burt. He vowed to himself that one day he would get back at the man. The family was left with no choice but to move in with Eunice's parents, Henry Pink Hegwood, whose brother fought and lost a leg in the Civil War, and Jenny May Presley Hegwood, who, believe it or not, was actually related to Elvis Presley. Billy's brother Ray, in his later years, would bear a striking resemblance to Elvis. In 1949, Eunice married a man named Pete Phillips, who operated a bulldozer at the county landfill, and things started to finally look up for the family. Pete rented the Jackson Farm on Chicken Lyle Road in Barrow County. Because it was across the county line, it meant the children would go to a new school, though only two to three days a week because they still had to work the farm. At 12 years old, Billy still couldn't say his ABCs or even write his name like most of his siblings. And times, though they were getting better, were still tough. He went to school, had no socks, and the teacher there, she seen him not go out at, at, at PE. And she said, Billy, why aren't you going out? And he said, I, I, I'll just stay in. Well, she looked at his shoes and she could see that they were gone. She said, Billy, hold your feet up. He held them up and she seen bare feet. So she took him in the little closet in there and she cut out pasteboard and put in the bottom of it. And the teacher took her own socks off and gave it to him. That's, I guess her heart went out to him. And he has said many times in his life that that lady is 
probably the closest thing to an angel on this earth he had ever met and probably ever would. And he loved her dearly. At age 13, Billy quit school and got a job at a local sawmill to help Pete provide for the family. He made 60 cents an hour. That's $24 a week. Keep in mind, at this time, a new car was only about $1,600, so it was pretty good money. At age 16, he got an offer through a family friend named Ernest Palmore to work at the Lay's Potato Chip Factory with him in Doraville, a neighborhood of Atlanta. It would be more money, so he took the job. This would be a monumental turning point in Billy Burt's life, though he didn't know it yet. After a few days on the job, a middle-aged woman walked over to the area Billy was working in, separating potato chips as they moved along a conveyor belt. She didn't know Billy, but she already didn't like him. It seems he filled the position she was hoping to get for her grandson. So she told their boss that Billy was eating potato chips off the conveyor line, which he admits he was. But this was a health code violation, and he promised not to do it again. A few days later, the woman again told the boss Billy was eating chips off the line, and he was fired from Lay's. But the woman had lied and cost him a good job. As he left, she gave him a dirty smirk. Billy decided right then and there he wasn't about to let her get away with it. He got to thinking about that. So what he done, he went about two hours with that. He hid and watched when he come out what car she went to. Well, she went to a 51 Ford, a black one. So he hid like going home. The next day, he got a way up there. And while she was working, he took a gallon of gas, <laughs> busted out a window, and pulled it in her car and stuck a back and hit the woods. But he didn't leave. He wanted to see her come out. And sure enough, she did. He said, oh, she was a ranting and raving and screaming and hollering like she was on fire. He said, but that, that done him good. He said, in my mind, that's my first act of vengeance that I've done. It felt pretty damn good. But Billy Burt wasn't finished yet. He said, that would have been the end of it. But about a month later, I'm riding down the road, me and my cousin Ralph Black and my brother Bobby Burt, and I come by this house, and here that old bitch was backing out of a driveway in a new Henry J. Brand new one. And I seen that, and I said to myself, damn, insurance company, give her a new car. And that got started eating on me. Well, she pulled up and headed down the road, probably going to church because it's on Sunday. I just whooped around. Ralph and Bob didn't know nothing about this now. All they know that I just whooped around and pulled back into this house. I figured it was hers. So I just kicked open the door, went in there, took the few things of I thought worth a damn. Stuck a damn match at the house. Rest of it. Let it burn. And felt pretty good. He said, but for some reason, it just wouldn't get out of my system. I got to think about her riding around that new Henry J. <laughs> I'll be damned if I didn't get up one weekday and uh, went back fired that sucker too. He burned her car twice. He burnt down her house. And that was his first act of vengeance. In that moment, all of the hateful, vengeful things buried deep inside of Billy came bubbling to the surface. Every time he had been screwed over in life, every bad hand he had been dealt. And just like that, the dark side of Billy Sunday Burt was born. Billy would often wonder later in life, had he not been fired from his job at Lay's, how different would his life have turned out? Billy went back to work at the sawmill for a few years, and at age 17, he would meet a young girl who we'll call Jenny, because Stoney asked me to keep her name out of this podcast for personal reasons. Parts of the Burt family have become somewhat disconnected since all this went down. But not long after meeting, they were married. Jenny was only 13 years old. 
Billy eventually got a job at the Gainesville Stone and Rock Quarry. He now had a wife to care for, and though he was making good money at the quarry, Billy also made a little extra on the side. He made top dollar, but he still supplemented it with moonshine. Making moonshine was a skill Billy learned from his grandfather, Pink Hegwood. It's a fairly simple process of fermenting cornmeal, sugar, yeast, and water into what's called mash, and then slowly heating the remaining liquid to distill it into clear alcohol. Billy would soon begin helping his new father-in-law, Mac Lee, make whiskey. Being highly illegal, they had to do it usually under cover of night and in remote, off-the-beaten-path places like a secluded farm deep in the woods. It was easy money, but that easy money would soon come at a price. Like the night that Billy and Mac were making whiskey under a bridge on the banks of the Appalachie River. Two men was crossing the bridge from Monroe coming into Bear County. Now my grandfather on my mother's side was laying under the bridge with a woman and they were both drunk. She was past that, so was my grandfather. Well, the men looked down there and uh, seen the truck, which blown my grandfather, seen my father, stopped, talked a minute, and they looked on the bridge and they seen uh, on the sandbar that lady laying there with my grandpa. To make another long story short, they decided they were gonna take the woman. Stony means the men wanted to rape the unconscious woman. My grandfather kept a uh, gun under his truck seat. It must have been something like a 49 Chevrolet 4 old truck. My father got the truck, come out with the gun, killed hell out of both of them. First time he ever killed anybody. This was 1960. The men are still buried on that riverbank. Billy and Mac buried the two men there, somewhere on the banks of the Appalachie River, and left, never to speak of it to one another again. Mac decided his whiskey-making days were over. But Billy had developed a taste for the easy money, excitement, and danger the bootlegging lifestyle provided. He soon partnered up with another man, a highly skilled whiskey kingpin named Hoke Chansey. He made the best whiskey and the most whiskey in Georgia from 1958 through 1964 right here in Wyoming, Georgia, until a tractor turned upside down on him and a freak accident killed him. When Hope died, his son Harold left veterinary school at the request of his mother, Ruth, to come home and take over the family business. And Harold was a natural. Harold was very, very good at making whiskey. And he took to it more than my daddy because my daddy did not enjoy making whiskey. In his words, damn work hard as hell. I'd rather take an ass kick and be working down look still. They done real well and Harold took his father's moonshine operation to a whole new level. By this time, Billy Burt was making money hand over fist. He could now afford things he never thought possible, like expensive jewelry and new souped up muscle cars to haul the whiskey in. It was an entirely different lifestyle than what he knew growing up. He now had children at home and his young wife, Jenny, Ask no questions, as long as the money kept coming in. He was selling and hauling whiskey all over the South, while Harold struggled to keep up with the demand. They were making hundreds of thousands of gallons and supplying Georgia, North and South Carolina. Billy started making money in other ways, too. He gambled in illegal card games nightly, and he had now become known around town as a man who could discreetly get things done for you. No questions asked for a price. He purchased the Winder Recreation Parlor, an unassuming pool hall in downtown to use as his base of operations, and now spent most of his time there, gambling until sunrise. He was on top of the world, and there was no turning back. Billy Burt would do whatever it took to never be poor again. A woman once told Billy Sunday Burt, Billy, you ain't never been innocent a day in your life. And that's true. He was guilty of a lot, awful lot. Do you think it's your son? Uh, I kind of believe it is. Why, why do you think so? 
Well, he was wearing blue pants when he left, and that's what that guy at FBI said, you know, a few minutes ago, said he was, had blue pants on. And he's been missing since when? November 4th. And you don't know if he was involved in any sort of uh, trouble? Well, as far as I know of, he went. The uh, citizens of Jefferson and Jackson County and this area are, of course, uh, were horrified to learn of this terrible uh, thing. And we are uh, disturbed uh, that a thing of this, uh, like this, could happen here in our community. We're obviously looking for something, and what we're looking for was, would best be uh, remain unknown at this time. It's not a body, though, is it? We're looking for something that would, if we find, if we find it, would be uh, subject to crime laboratory examination, and that's all I can tell you. Billy Byrd is, is without a doubt one of the most prolific killers uh, in, in the history of, of our country. I mean, without a doubt. I mean, he was a bad man. Killed a lot of people. People scared? Scared to talk, I think. You think now that people will start to come I, forward and talk? I think they'll start coming forward and talking now. Why are they so scared? Well, that I couldn't say not right now. Are you scared? No, I sure ain't. If I had, I wouldn't be standing right here. Winder or Barrow County, Hall County, all over northeast Georgia? Well, what? I'd be afraid to say right now. Are you talking about moonshine, auto theft, everything? I wouldn't want to say right now. Everybody in town knew that what was happening, he was doing it. Everybody in town knew that he was the epitome of a gangster. He was the leader of Georgia Dixon Mafia. It was common knowledge unsaid. But nobody called him Godfather. Nobody kissed his hand. They were friends. Every one of them talked to him on a weekly basis to get him to do jobs, and that's where the murder started piling up. The price was $5,000 for anybody in-house. Now, if somebody in-house had a buddy out of the circle that wanted something done, it was $10,000. The people that were missing, bar none, were snitches. There were people that had told, or was going to testify, or had testified and run. So up to a certain point, I think the town's mentality was, well, you know, when you play a rough game, that's what happened to you. I was conditioned. It was okay. Anything you done was okay. He had his reasons. They must have deserved that because he done it. That's my, was my mentality. It's hard to explain. I never had fear for my father. I never had fear for the consequences. In my mind, in my simplistic childhood mind, I just knew being a shadow of a doubt he would always stay one step ahead of the law. In the Red Clay is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was created, written, and reported by me, Sean Kipe, and I wrote and created the original music score. Executive producers are Jason Hoke and Gino Falsetto. Story editor is Jason Hoke. Produced and engineered by Shane Freeman, Jason Hoke, and myself. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. Voice sessions recorded at Tree Sound Studios, Atlanta, Georgia. Archival footage licensed courtesy of Brown Media Archives, University of Georgia, and WSB-TV in Atlanta, Georgia. In the Red Clay is a 12-episode series with new episodes available every Tuesday. Follow us on Instagram at In the Red Clay Podcast. Have questions? Email us at podcasts at imperativeentertainment.com. If you like the show, tell your friends and leave us a review. Thanks for listening.